Okay. All right. Good morning or afternoon or evening, any, everybody. I uh, hope you're a little bit more comfortable than uh, in the normal lecture hall. Um, today we're going to talk about El Nino and La Nina. It's, it's a pretty appropriate winter to talk about that since uh, we're in the midst of one of the strongest El Ninos on record. Um, so that's why I kind of moved this lecture up in the, in the semester this, sem this semester. You go over here and get my mouse so I can change the slides. Um, and then we should be good to go. I think we should be good to go. There we go. So um, El Nino and La Nina are an example of internal variability in the climate system. Um, eventually, when we start to talk about greenhouse gases and things like that, these are external influences on the climate. But things like El Nino and La Nina are kind of natural variations uh, within the climate system. Um, you know, things that are forced might be greenhouse gases or the sun's output or when we talk about um, ice ages, the, the Earth's orbit. But these things that are kind of internal are, are really the way they, they have to do with the physics of the ocean and the climate system itself. So they're internal to the system. Um, basically, we can talk about um, two phases of this oscillation. The warm phase is typically called El Nino. Um, in, we'll be talking, we'll see some graphs that will be in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And here uh, during El Nino, the sea surface temperature warms by several tenths of a degree above its normal value. La Nina is the opposite phase and it's the cool phase. So the sea surface temperatures in this part of the ocean are going to cool. Um, we really can't say that either one of these phases is kind of normal or not. When it's El Nino, we can't say it's abnormal, but because it's, it's truly a cycle and there's a permanent variation uh, between these two phases. And we'll see they affect both the ocean and the atmosphere. Kind of before I move on, a little bit of history about El Nino. Um, El Nino has been around for a long time. Um, however, um, Kind of the derivation of its name and, and how, we, um, how we think about it has kind of evolved from pretty much the mid-1980s to the present. Um, it really gets its name um, from a, a warm ocean current, that actually a cool ocean current, that actually uh, flows off the coast of Peru, so off the coast of South America. And the fact that the ocean waters there are, are cool, um, they tend to be very productive to fish life. Um, Actually, in, in earlier days, there was a, a very a thriving fishery off the coast of Peru. Most of the anchovies in the world came from the coast of Peru. Um, so the Peruvian economy was very dependent upon um, the ocean waters and the fishing. Um, what the fishermen saw, though, every year is right around Christmas time, the cold waters that were normally there would go away, and the waters off the coast would warm up. And as a result, the fish would go away. So the Peruvian fishermen actually thought this was a good thing. It was right around Christmas. Peru is a, a Christian country. So um, you know, they kind of used this as an excuse to take a vacation around the holidays. And then after the holidays, the cooler waters would return and their fisheries would um, come, back, come back like they expected. So they kind of called this annual phenomena that came around Christmas every year, El Nino, pretty much after the Christ child. Um, Later on, as we moved into the you know, 70s and 80s and we started to see satellites, um, the idea of El Nino kind of expanded and it was no longer just focused off the coast of Peru, but scientists saw that this was a, a, a much more broad phenomena that um, affected a good portion of the Pacific Ocean, if not the world. So we can see some examples from recent history, um, just kind of a climate record and um, kind of the granddaddy up until this year of all El Ninos occurred in 1998. And what we're looking at here is actually global surface temperature. And we see that El Nino winter, that El Nino year, was much, much warmer than normal. And if my graph continued out here to 2015, which it will in another one, uh, we would see too that this year, or we've already seen that this year with an El Nino is really the next uh, warmest or, or has it surpassed that 1998 as being the warmest year on record. Um, kind of give you an idea of where we're talking about the lay of the land. Here's the United States, Mexico, Central America. Here's the coast of South America. Peru would be right here. Uh, the white line is the equator. Um, Australia. Um, I'm going to refer to this area as Indonesia. 
And if your eyes are really good, somewhere out here is Tahiti. So those are kind of the geographic locations that I'll use uh, throughout most of my lecture. And um, so really, this is the part of the ocean that um, El Nino uh, affects, or where we see the, uh, the start of El Nino. And uh, what, this, what this series of slides is showing is actually the red and the, and the yellow dots are actually buoy locations. So these are locations where scientists, NOAA, the Weather Service, um, the World Meteorological Organization, uh, takes measurements of ocean temperature in the Pacific. And you can see back in 1985 when I was in grad school, there weren't very many buoys there. And actually in 1985, there happened to be an experiment going on in the Pacific. People were starting to look at this. And the research crew that did this was very, very lucky because they actually stumbled upon a very, very strong El Nino as, as they started their research observations. So, um, and then as that moved on, you could see the importance of this part of the ocean um, as that became more well known, the number of observations that were taken there expanded quite a bit. So if we look at uh, that part of the ocean today, this is kind of the latest sea surface temperature map from the tropical Pacific. Again, lay of the land, here's Peru, South America, here's the equator, going across Indonesia, Australia. Um, what we're looking here is ocean temperatures. And what you'll notice is the warmest water is in the western part of the Pacific Ocean. So in this part of the ocean in early February, we're talking about ocean temperatures almost 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So kind of do the math there. We're talking upper 80s probably in terms of, I'm sorry, 30 degrees centigrade. So if we do the math, we're talking upper 80s Fahrenheit for the ocean temperature. Um, and as we go across the Pacific to the east, um, the, the water cools off off the coast of Peru. Maybe we're in the order of 26 or 27 degrees C. Um, this warm water here really isn't the thing that signals El Nino, but really what we want to look at are the anomalies of the ocean temperature. So we've talked about anomalies already when we talked about the surface temperature of the Earth. So here we're talking about anomalies in the ocean. And really as a definition of El Nino, what it represents is a strong positive anomaly of sea surface temperature, either in the central or the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. So in kind of right now in, in, in February of 2016, in the central Pacific Ocean, we're talking about anomalies of two to three degrees Fahrenheit. So this is significant. The highest anomalies we typically see here in the strongest El Ninos are around three degrees. So again, a measure of this being the strongest. So um, when we have the test or something like that, don't get confused. Even though the water is warmer over here, the fact that the water, the, the anomalies of sea surface temperature are positive in the central and eastern part of the Pacific is the thing that really keys us in on El Nino. Um, again, looking at some events, this was the last big El Nino in December of 1997. We can see these are sea surface temperature anomalies. And we can see South America, central part of the Pacific, a really broad area of um, quite strong sea surface temperature anomalies, a little bit stronger than they are now. Um, this is the current map here. So a little bit different picture, but still this broad tongue of warm water, warm ocean anomalies extending from South America to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, contrast that to January of 1999, when there was a La Nina, and we see that across the central part of the Pacific Ocean, event, uh, especially, the anomalies were cooler than normal, on the order of two or maybe two and a half degrees below what they should have been. So again, El Nino is warm ocean temperatures. La Nina is cooler uh, than normal ocean temperatures. Um, so again, let's kind of put it all together. Um, this is my little schematic of the tropical Pacific up at the top. Um, this line here represents kind of the boundary between the atmosphere, which is up here, and the ocean, which is down here. Um, and if you remember the lecture from last Friday, um, we saw that in this part of the world, in the tropics, the winds are primarily blowing from east to west. So I have easterly winds in the tropics. They're blowing from, say, South America here with the llama to the kangaroo over Australia in the west. And kind of as a result of that, if you're sitting in the right direction, they actually push the ocean water 
all the way to the west. And that water kind of builds up uh, as it pushes against the Asian continent. So this, if this is actually the sea surface temperature, it, it slopes upward. The sea level is higher in the west than it is in the east. Um, also, this is the equator, so the winds are pushing lots and lots of warm water to the west. So typically, under normal conditions, we have a pool of warm water in this area where the water is piling up in the west. And it piles up not only, you know, increasing sea level, but also goes down to depth. We have a very, very deep pool of warm water in the western Pacific Ocean. If I move over to the east, you know, this wind is pushing all the water to the west. And it doesn't leave a big gaping hole here with no water in the west, but what happens is water from deep in the ocean is pulled up to the surface. And water deep in the ocean is cold. So the normal pattern under normal conditions are warm to the west because all the warm water is being pushed there. And in the east, the water is cooler because the water that replaces the water that's pushed to the west is coming from deep in the ocean. This is a process that we call upwelling. The other thing to note in my picture here is this other line which I call the thermocline. And really all the thermocline is is um, kind of the boundary in the ocean that separates the warm surface water from the colder water that's below it. So here's an example, just a schematic. This is depth of the ocean. And what we typically see is real close to the surface in the tropics, the water's real warm, but then very quickly the temperature declines as we go into depth. So this kind of very sharp change from very warm water to very cool water over a small depth is called the thermocline. So we can think of it as the boundary between warm surface water and cold uh, subsurface water. <clears throat> So what brings about El Nino and its counterpart, La Nina, is really thought to be changes in the strength of the easterly winds in the tropics. Um, don't ask me why the winds weaken or strengthen. Um, they just do. It's actually an area of research. But what we can see is during El Nino, like we have now, the easterly winds in the tropics tend to be weak. And therefore, they're less able to push the warm water all the way to the west. So what we see is less water being pushed to the west, and therefore the need for less water to come up from the surface. So the fact that we lose this cold water coming up to the surface, and pretty much we see then that the whole surface, across the whole ocean, the water tends to be warmer, just due to the fact that we've weakened the winds. The counterpart is La Nina, and in La Nina, these easterly winds tend to be stronger than normal. So they push the water to the west even more. They pile up the water in the west much, much more, both into the atmosphere, so sea level rises, and also increases this warm pool deep in the ocean. And as a result, the thermocline becomes very, very sloped. It actually almost intersects the surface. So the water here to the east under um, La Nina conditions is much, much colder than it normally would be. Okay? So that's kind of the contrast. It all has to do with how strong or how weak or how strong the winds are in the tropics. So um, look at this a little bit uh, differently, kind of the same type of things. Here's my La, La Nina conditions. Strong winds pushing all the warm water to the west. The thermocline is very sloped in the cold water is up here at the surface. Under normal conditions, so this is not El Nino, this is kind of the in-between condition. Again, all the warm water is, is over to the west. Notice in this picture, it's not quite as far over to the west. So the stronger wind is really pushing this warm water way to the west under La Nina conditions. And also, notice the thermocline. Under normal conditions, yes, it's sloped, and we do see some cold water off the coast of South America, but it's not as sloped as it is here. So again, La Nina, the warm water pushes the thermocline down in the west, and the thermocline pops up to the surface in the east. Um, here's El Nino conditions versus normal. So this is the same graph of normal that I showed you before. But during El Nino, the winds weaken, 
this water that I was originally pushing all the way up against the Western Atlantic, or I mean, sorry, the Western Pacific, without the winds pushing it, it relaxes, kind of sloshes back in the ocean. So now we see it in the central and eastern part of the, the Pacific Ocean, and the thermocline relaxes. It's nowhere near as sloped. This whole area above the thermocline is essentially warmer water. So it relaxes in the west and it sinks in the east. So kind of there they are together. Um, the other thing I've added to these graphs is where most of the clouds form. So these pictures of clouds represent where most of the rainfall is. And also if we talk about atmospheric pressure, where the air rises and forms these clouds, the pressure is typically low. So we would expect there to be a low pressure system there. Outside of this, and particularly where the air is sinking, we would expect there not to be clouds and high pressure. So in some ways, we can think of this as sort of a mini Hadley circulation. It's actually in the next slide, we'll see it's called the Walker circulation. But the idea is where the surface is the warmest, the air rises and we get clouds and precipitation. The air hits the top of the atmosphere and spreads out and it eventually sinks. And where it sinks, it inhibits cloud formation and we tend to have high pressure. So if we look at this kind of sequence of slides, during La Nina conditions, when the warm water is way to the west, the convection and the low pressure is way to the west, over Indonesia, over Australia. And most of the rest of the Pacific Ocean has sinking air, high pressure, little rainfall. Normal conditions, same type of thing. The, the convection and the low pressure and the rainfall is still fairly far to the western Pacific Ocean. And say over South America and Peru, it's very dry. When we move to El Nino, though, things change quite a bit. All of this convection moves to the central and eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. This is where the low pressure and the rising air set up. And we have sinking air, but still over South America. But the biggest contrast is over Australia and Indonesia, we have sinking air. So a place that normally is wet and rainy with low pressure ends up being actually sunny and dry. During El Nino conditions, this part of the world sees most of its most severe droughts. Again, same type of thing. We call this the Walker circulation. The Walker circulation, instead of the Hadley cell being north-south, the Walker circulation operates across the Pacific Ocean. So under normal conditions, generally rising air in the west, air spreading out, sinking in the east, and then here's my return easterly flow across the Pacific Ocean. So let's take a little quiz, kind of anticlimactic since I'm not here to ask you questions. But here's a graph. Um, it's showing the, east, the Central Pacific Ocean, Australia, South America. And I would ask you guys, is this El Nino or La Nina? And hopefully, given all the blue in the Central Pacific, you would tell me that these are La Nina conditions when we have an exam in a couple of weeks. If I showed you this graph, again, it's sea surface temperature, which lots of red. So this would be a typical El Nino uh, situation. You can also look at this with depth. So kind of a different figure. This is depth in the ocean. This is the ocean surface. South America here. Australia here. And might ask, is this El Nino or La Nina? And hopefully what you would tell me is over here in the west, where we normally expect lots of cold water, we see this big blob of warm water in the Central Pacific Ocean. So this would be an El Nino situation. And we might contrast that to lots of cold water here, lots of warm water to the west. This would be a good example of La Nina. Um, like I said, El Nino and La Nina sort of work in cycles. And uh, what there tends to be in this case is sort of a feedback between the two. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna go back to a different slide. Eh, maybe I can use this one. Um, I'm gonna pick on La Nina first. So this graph is La Nina. And remember, what happens here is during La Nina, we have very strong westerly, uh, we have very strong winds from the east pushing the water to the west. They cause rising air here. The air rises, spreads out, sinks, 
And really, the fact that we have low pressure over here due to the fact that the air is rising, what do you think it does to these winds? We have high pressure here and low pressure here. These winds are further strengthened. And so if these are further strengthened, they pile more warm water up here. The low pressure gets deeper. There's more rising air. There's colder air here, more sinking air, more high pressure. So again, the winds further strengthen. So once we get something like La Nina, the normal pattern of what might go on really reinforces itself. It becomes hard for it to get out of this cycle. Um, we'll see later on in class that we call something like this a positive feedback. The wind strengthened for some reason, La Nina develops, and that further strengthens these, these winds, with, which further strengthens La Nina, kind of keeps on going. So we're also going to have to talk about a mechanism on how we might get out of La Nina conditions once we get into them. Same thing with El Nino. If we have El Nino conditions, let's say or the easterly winds weaken, and uh, really what we see is a disruption of the pattern here. Remember, the low pressure is really over here, and that's what's driving the normal easterly winds. But now, really, the low pressure is more to the eastern Pacific, and we actually have higher pressure to the west. So that actually counteracts these easterly winds, causing them to weaken even more. So we can talk about this same type of positive feedback with El Nino. As the winds weaken, the way the highs and the lows set up, they further weaken those winds and intensify in El Nino. <coughs> I'm going to go back. So the question becomes in this case, how do we get out of an El Nino? And um, it's actually, uh, I could spend a couple of lectures talking about it, which I'm not, but kind of the simple analogy of what happens is, let's say we're in La Nina conditions, and we're piling up all this water to the west. Okay? And the winds keep blowing. Eventually what happens is, remember I also said the warm water also sinks down. So the thermocline is pushed very far downward. We can almost think of that pushing down of the thermocline as sort of acting like a wave. So we have this warm water that we've pushed up against the western part of the Pacific Ocean, up against the Asian and Australian continents. And when we hit that kind of kind of think of it as a wall by pushing all that warm water. Below the ocean surface, there, there's a wave that actually travels with depth across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, wrong ocean, across the Pacific Ocean. And really what it does is disrupts this thermocline. And eventually, instead of cold water from depth being brought up to the surface, actually warm water from the western part of the Pacific is what's being brought up to the surface in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So that's the thing that kind of um, breaks this cycle, this positive feedback. The wave that comes back across the Pacific is called a Kelvin wave at depth. And really what we see is the kind of the time frame between El Nino and the next El Nino, or El Nino and La Nina, is on the order of three or four years. And we could do the math and actually we could calculate the speed of a Kelvin wave across the Pacific Ocean, and we'll see that it takes about that long for that Kelvin wave to get there. So that's one way we can explain the cycle. We've pushed the water up, we've intensified the cycle, but that water at depth kind of sloshed back as a Kelvin wave and warmed up, disrupted this pattern of cold in the west, uh, cold in the east, warm in the west. Um, all right. We can also look at El Nino and La Nina um, in terms of how they affect the atmosphere. So I think we've seen that atmospheric pressure in the Pacific or over the Pacific is affected by where the warm water anomalies are. And if we look at El Nino conditions, what tends to happen, again, warm water, rising air in the central part of the Pacific Ocean, where Tahiti is. So during El Nino conditions, Tahiti in the central Pacific tends to have lower atmospheric pressure. Darwin, which is in Australia, in the far west, tends to have higher pressure because that's where the air is now sinking. 
during La Nina, the pattern is reversing. The warmest water is pushed far to the west in the Pacific Ocean. The low pressure and the rising air follow that, so Darwin in Australia sees lower pressure. In Tahiti in the southern part, uh, Tahiti in the central part of the Pacific Ocean is where the air is sinking, and therefore it sees high pressure. So we can look at these two stations and kind of come up with a relationship for when there is El Nino and when there's La Nina. And this is important. We've taken pressure observations at Tahiti and Darwin for at least 100 years, maybe 150 years. We only have good sea surface temperature measurements in the Pacific Ocean for maybe you know, 40 or 50 years. So it really extends our understanding of, of the cycles of El Nino and the fact that El Nino has been a phenomenon that has occurred for a very long period of time. So um, using these pressure relationships, we can come up with an index. That index is called the Southern Oscillation Index. And really, all it is is um, it looks at the difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. So during El Nino, Tahiti has, uh, um, during El Nino, Tahiti has low pressure. That's where the rising air is. Darwin has high pressure. That's where the sinking air is. So we have a small number minus a big number, which gives us our southern oscillation index, which in this case is less than zero. That would be correspond to El Nino. During La Nina conditions, Tahiti has high pressure. Darwin has the low pressure. So we have a big number minus a small number. That gives us a positive difference. So SOI is greater than zero in that case. So instead of looking at the sea surface temperatures, we can look at the, its effect on the atmosphere and also get a measure. So here's an example of the Southern Oscillation Index going back to 1955. Um, here we are today. It's at least January of 2015. Notice we're in El Nino conditions. So the Southern Oscillation is negative. So even though the water temperatures in the central part of the Pacific are warmer than normal, the southern oscillation index is negative because we see Tahiti minus Darwin, Tahiti's pressure is low, Darwin's pressure is high, so we have a negative number. A couple of other El Nino events. Here's a big El Nino event in the 80s. Here's the big El Nino event in 1997-1998. What really shows up nicely here is kind of this flip-flop pattern. The first thing I should really say is kind of, if I drew a line here at 1, any time these bars drop below 1, that's when we typically say there's an El Nino. These red bars up here really mean nothing. We can think of those as normal conditions. And the same thing up here. Any time these blue bars hop above 1, we'll call that um, La Nina conditions. So we can see kind of, at least in here, El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina, these things tend to operate, tend to occur in a nice cycle. The pattern might not be all that regular. You might say here there was a big El Nino and not much of an, a La Nina and actually another good size El Nino that followed before you got a good La Nina. But for the most part, you have this cyclical pattern. We looked at that one already. Um, I spoke of that already, this idea of the water sloshing back and forth and breaking out these positive and negative feedbacks. So you can read that on your own. Um, same type of thing there. I got ahead of myself a little bit earlier. So um, we can see here again in words the strengthening of this, the positive feedback, and how it might be broken up. Um, these things have a loose four to seven year cycle. That means from one El Nino to the next is about four to seven years. Typically, there's a La Nina in between, but not always. Um, we also have indices in terms of the sea surface temperature. So instead of SOI, this is a, a pattern of sea surface temperature anomalies. In what's called the Nino 3.4 region, again, kind of the central part of the Pacific Ocean, South America, Australia. And again, this is an older one, but we can see El Nino, not much going on here. 
maybe another El Nino, um, a strong El, a La Nina, another El Nino, really not much going on, another El Nino, and you can see the back and forth cycle there in the sea surface temperatures as well. Um, and again, if we bring this up to the present, uh, here we are in February of 2016 with an SST anomaly of, um, this is a bit dated, the, the latest observations have us up around here on par with the two strongest El Ninos that have ever occurred on record. The last thing I want to talk about today is how what goes on in the Pacific Ocean actually affects other parts of the world. So we can kind of, the best way that I can describe this is the first thing we do is if we look right in the Pacific Ocean, Tahiti, Australia, kind of South America, um, it shouldn't be too surprising that during El Nino, what I'm calling warm episodes there, remember the rising air is here in the Central Pacific Ocean, so Tahiti tends to be warmer and wetter. Over Indonesia, parts of Asia, Australia, where the air is now sinking, tends to be, in most cases, drier, um, warm and dry in terms of sinking air. So there's a direct effect on kind of the climate of this region based on where the warm water is. Um, this happens in winter and also actually in summer, if we're in there. Rising air still, wet, sinking air, dry. But probably what's more interesting is what might happen downstream over the United States. Okay. As we get up maybe to these regions, remember the winds now are moving from west to east. We're outside of the tropics. And the, the fact that we have all this rising air and convection here and all this sinking air there, um, really the best analogy I can make you think about it is, is think about a stream. And if all of a sudden I put a big rock in the stream here, and I disrupt the flow of the stream, that's going to that's gonna have a lot of effect on the flow downward in that stream, down from that rock. That, it's only, not only going to affect where the rock is, but it's going to affect the stream further downstream. The same thing is going here with where the high pressure, and, excuse me, the low pressure and the high pressure set up also affect where the low pressure and the high pressure set up downstream. <coughs> what we typically see is during El Nino winters, the northern tier of the U.S. tends to be very warm, and the Gulf Coast tends to be not only wet, not only cool, but also wet. So this winter is a great example. We have an El Nino, we're up here in the northern tier, we've been much warmer than normal. If you look along the Gulf Coast or look across California, they've been very wet and they've been cooler than normal. This pattern kind of goes away in the summertime, except for one thing here in the Caribbean, where it's dry and warm. And the reason for that, one of the strongest, strongest signals of El Nino is in the summertime, it suppresses hurricane activity in the Atlantic Ocean. So we see very few hurricanes during summers that have El Nino. Think back at last summer, that we had a strong El Nino going on, and we had very few hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, during La Nina, so it's referred to as the cold episode there, the opposite patterns happen. The rising air and low pressure are here in the west, so it's not too surprising that it's wet there. The sinking air is in this part of the Pacific Ocean, so it's not too surprising that it's dry. Same thing in the summer. Across the U.S., again, the opposite pattern. Where it used to be warm during El Nino, it ends up being cool. So next winter, if we have a La Nina, which we're expected to have, we'll probably have a cooler winter than we've seen this year. The Gulf Coast, which was, which was cool and wet during El Nino, is now dry and warm during La Nina conditions. The Caribbean during the summer tends to be wet because the hurricanes come back. So again, typical El Nino winter, mild and less snow, wet and cool along the coast. Perfect pattern for this winter, classic. And a typical La Nina pattern 
cold episodes coming down. Here we are here in New York. So um, hopefully you're going to graduate before next winter. Um, we can also look back at historical records from the station data and say, okay, what do we see in years that have El Nino versus La Nina? So this is a winter, January, February, March, across the U.S. Um, during El Nino. And again, you see cooler than normal temperatures along the southern part of the U.S. and warmer than normal temperatures along the northern tier. Not quite as strong as we see in those idealized patterns, but nonetheless, this cool type of warm pattern across the U.S. Um, don't worry about this graphic over there. If we move to a La Nina winter, the opposite. Cooler along the northern tier, warmer across the Gulf Coast. It affects rainfall, and this is an El Nino winter. Notice it's very wet along the coast. Again, one of the strong signals of El Nino is a lot more coastal storms in winter. That's why Washington got a big snowstorm. It was an El Nino winter. You can look back in the records in almost eight, the, I think it's eight out of the ten biggest snowfalls in Washington, not including this past one, have occurred during El Nino winters. A very strong pattern of a coastal storm track in the winter. And very little precip to the west. Here we are here. That's why we don't have a lot of snow, because we've actually also been fairly dry with the storm track well off to our east. Uh, during La Nina winters, we tend to be wetter than normal. Again, kind of that opposite pattern. So if you know what, if you remember what the pattern is for El Nino, just think of the opposite and you'll remember what the pattern is for La Nina. Um, have also patterns in the summer. Um, you can look at those yourself. Um, they tend not to be as strong as we move through summer during El Nino and La Nina. Um, still some strong patterns out in the west. Rainfall as well. Um, perhaps one of the strongest patterns is during La Nina in the summer. Uh, we tend to have dryness, particularly in the central part of the U.S. So again, a relationship between central U.S. drought and La Nina conditions in a lot of cases. And I kind of like to close by saying that um, folks also do forecasts of El Nino conditions. And this is the latest forecast from actually a group at Columbia and also the National Weather Service. And what it's showing here along the vertical axis is the Central Pacific sea surface temperature anomaly. So here's zero, warmer than normal, colder than normal. And we start to get excited, you know, think of El Nino conditions when this value is, a, is above about 1 or 1.5. So currently, kind of December, uh, December, January, February, so we're kind of right around here. Notice all these models are showing strong El Nino conditions. But then also notice as we move into the summer, June, July, and August, all of the models have this... Um, very warm sea surface temperature anomaly actually returning to normal. And then as we move into the next winter, or into the fall, this is September, October, November, a good number or several of the models actually start to fall below negative one. So these are an indication that as we move out of this El Nino event, um, there's a good indication by, by the models that next winter will bring El Nino, uh, La Nina conditions. I actually extended this out further and saw next winter a lot of these other models kind of fall below this, this magical negative one line, which is usually the, the thing that um, differentiates normal conditions from La Nina conditions. So I probably spoke a lot quicker than normal since I'm talking to myself, but you can hear me in slow motion or something when you play back the video. Um, if you have any questions about lecture, that would be a good time to, to come to office hours. Um, there are also are lots and lots of kind of El Nino resources available on the web. They're on Blackboard uh, that'll go along with the lecture on El Nino. There's several links there. So uh, if you want to get a tutorial from one of them, that would be another way to kind of uh, get another view of this material. So enjoy your break and see you all on Wednesday.